Um, we're just doing, an, uh, as is the spirit of uh, DocFest, we're doing a little bit of 360 filming as we go. So um, <laughs> just to be uh, sort of indigenous to the environment, perhaps. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as May mentions, my name is Verity McIntosh, and I'm from a place called the Pervasive Media Studio, uh, which is within Watershed in Bristol. Who's been? Just give me a clue. Lovely. Who lives there? Thank you. Yep. <laughs> uh, for, the, for those of you who haven't been before, uh, so the Pervasive Media Studio is a very open... There's a spider. That's exciting. OK, a very open, very, <laughs> very exciting environment. We don't have many spiders, but if we did, it would be drawn either from a background in creativity, technology, or research. I don't know what this spider's background is, but it would be welcome to join us within the studio. Uh, we broadly take the view that uh, if we can create a, a physical environment where people from different practices, different backgrounds, different uh, ways of looking at the world have an opportunity to come together, to talk to each other, to question each other's ideas in a sort of a, a constructive but supportive environment, everybody has a chance to do better. So we run a number of programs and schemes, and we have a resident community of over 120 people who come together to sort of R&D their early ideas. So that's where, where I come from. Um, today, I'm really delighted to be invited to chair a panel looking at, I think we call it, it's a family affair, and it's small stories for big, big ideas, um, which it has a lovely kind of intimacy to it already. And I think what we're trying to, um, to explore together with our panelists today is a, a notion that is, obviously has a long and rich and beautiful history within documentary practice, which is that if we can um, allow ourselves to focus in, to be um, vulnerable, intimate, to take individual stories, family histories, to bring often the experience of the practitioner to bear in the work that we make, we have an opportunity to kind of create those moments of intimacy with audiences, with participants, and to be able to tell bigger stories. So partly when, uh, when looking at this topic, I was thinking a little bit, well, isn't that what documentary practice does anyway? And can we sort of call out this, this question of, is, is there anything different happening here? Or is this um, a variation on something that we, we know as practitioners? And I think perhaps um, what I'd like us to think about today a little bit is uh, not this binary between um, filmmakers and interactive makers that's been kind of emerging through, um, through sort of narratives in the media over the previous few years, and think more about the fact that as storytellers, we have a myriad um, toolkit of, of materials and options now when we make stories. We can think about what the, the, right, um, the right sort of fabrics, the right textures are for the stories that we're telling. That might be about creating in VR. It might be about making physical worlds. It might be about um, constructing environments or making games that speak to the story that we're telling. But I want to try and see, for you, as a provocation today, to see if you can kind of consider your practice as a storyteller rather than as a filmmaker or as a game maker or as an interactive maker. So that's my, that's my sort of opening poke for all of you. Um, what I would like to do today is uh, to give three extraordinary makers who are experimenting with form and who are faithful very much to this idea of the sort of the, the small story for, for a big idea to share with you some of what they've done. They all have work within, um, within the Interactive Expo just in uh, Millennium Gallery. So if you haven't seen it already, I would um, say definitely after this, you'll be inspired to do so. And they each have very different, um, different experiences and different contexts that they're working in. So I'm going to give them each a really hideous five minutes, which is extremely mean of me, and I will be very, very strict, because I know that um, perhaps the best conversation to be had is, is with you and with each other, and so I'm going to be a, a horrible stickler for timings. Um, and so on that basis, I'm not going to take any more of our time, and I would like to first introduce our first panellist, so Genaro Vallejo Reyes. Mm -hmm. How'd I do? Um, that's good. <laughs> uh, close enough, OK. Uh, so um, Genaro is a, a game maker and developer uh, who's currently based in New York, working with Gamesco, um, but is originally from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like you to introduce yourself briefly and tell us a little bit about Borders, please. Ah, yes, thank you. Um, well, um, I'm a game designer. Um, I started working um, uh, in New York. Um, this is myself. Um, this is also Gonzalo. Gonzalo was the artist and also the creator of the idea around Borders. Um, and also the programmer, John Di Giacomo. Uh, we actually um, we work in this game um, remotely because uh, Gonzalo lives in, in Austin, Texas, and I live in New York. So I meet him by, by, by in, a, in an event, in an indie video game event. So we became close friends because we both like, have me Mexican heritage. 
So um, we work in a really tight schedule of, of game jam, so we try our best to work on, on have the game finish in one week. And, and we, we actually did it. And, and, and it's uh, Gonzalo and John first games. I already had experience working with games before, so I helped them like through the process. And eventually, also Gonzalo made the cabinet that you can you can play right now on the on the alternate reality um, showcase. He made it for an exhibition in his university in Texas, and that got a lot of media attention. And eventually, um, we got selected for Sheffield. So. Uh, myself, personally, I'm really excited to be here. This is my first time in, in UK, so I'm, I'm really happy to, to um, share this with you. So, um, I don't know if you can go to the next one. <laughs> yeah, I want to also talk a little more about the Game Warriors. Um, basically, it's um, ex um, put you in the shoes of, of, the, of um, a guy that tries to cross the Mexican-US borders, but right now it's a really big subject with all the politics going around. Uh, Basically, this game is an adventure a stealth game that you have to like evade the um, the migra that is um, those border patrol guys um, in green walking around. So you have to move. It, the controls are really simple. You just move up, left, and right, and and you have to sneak past them. And every time like you 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 get caught or you die because you also have to like. Um, keep track of your hydration level. You have to pick um, water bottles around the, uh, the game. Uh, and you, if you die, you leave a skeleton behind. So uh, it's a reminder of every, every time a player fails the game, you will see like, the, all the, the, the memories of other players experience the game. Uh, and I think that game mechanic in particular is really resonated with a lot of people. And, and I think that um, that experience, uh, um, based on also on Gonzalo um, parents' history in, in crossing the border and, and other, other, um, other Mexicans, such as me, and, and other people from South America too, um, that they um, have to risk their lives to, to find something better. And I think that's really beautiful. And as a Mexican immigrant myself, I can relate to that. Um, Thank you. You're Wonderful. welcome. <laughs> Lovely. So um, I should say we were, we were going to have um, Jen Breer, who some of you may know, on the panel, and she just sends her apologies this morning. Um, she made the piece called Unrest and Unrest VR that some of you may have come across, which is a, a portrait of her own experience with ME. And um, for anyone who has sort of friends or family, it would be completely understandable why today she wasn't able to join us for health reasons. Um, you can still see her work in the expo. So if you would uh, like to sort of um, still have a window into her, her practice, I would encourage you to go and do so. However, we are extremely lucky to be joined by now, I'm going to do your name wrong. I'm going to do everyone's name wrong, just for equality. So uh, Marc serpa Francourt, how do we do? Excellent. Excellent, fantastic. <laughs> so Mark is the founder of Lost Time Media, um, which is a, now then, I'm also gonna try something here. So I would say you're a Toronto-based production, production company, but I met Barbara over there on the way in, who tells me it's Trana. Trana? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> My language skills are going <laughs> yeah. through the roof today. This is delicious. Okay, so, so from Trana. Uh, and particularly, um, I'm gonna invite you to speak to us a little bit about a piece, uh, an interactive documentary piece called The World in 10 Blocks, which um, gives us a window into Trana as a, uh, one of the most diverse cities, culturally diverse cities in the world. Um, particularly uh, an environment where diversity and difference is, is celebrated and is be being built as a success story rather than a, a sort of a challenge to metropolitan life. And I think that's an extremely strong message that we can, we can kind of zero in on a little bit. Um, so before I, I say too much about it, could you give us a little, little bit of history? Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me. Actually, according to your own BBC, uh, apparently, Toronto is deemed the most diverse city in the world. We were very excited to hear that. Oh. Um, yeah, I'm one half of Lost Time Media. My partner, uh, Ruben Ruppel, lives in the San Francisco Bay Area these days, unfortunately. Um, uh, the project I'm here with, The World in Ten Blocks, is about immigrant small business owners um, in a particular neighborhood in Toronto. Um, you know, it's interesting, we very, uh, it was always a motive for us going back very early on to share um, what we feel is special about where we are with Europe. And this is a first opportunity to do so, so Great. that's exciting. Um, this is a project that started a long time ago. Uh, it was a long 
time coming. It's a little bit unusual for a larger scale um, interactive in that it's just the two of us that kind of figured out how to do everything over time, including um, Rabinder actually learned to code specifically so we could do this type of work while we were doing the project. Um, so it's a multimedia experience. Our emphasis is really in terms of design on it being accessible uh, for people of all ages. Um, it's also unusual in that it's uh, quite broadly accessible across platforms, including not only desktop, but tablet, mobile, um, which uh, of course complicated things dramatically when it came to the, the coding. Um, perhaps I'll show, could we watch the trailer? Yeah, I could speak Do we have for the trailer there? I'm sorry to say, actually, that wasn't the right trailer. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the idea. Um, there's also a linear film uh, as part of the project, so that's what that was. Um, but same, similar cast of characters. Uh, the story, if you can check it out, um, the, or the experience, interactive experience, has sort of two main components. One is a sort of stop-motion-esque street exploration. Um, and then you go into the businesses and meet the business owners. Um, and it's a multimedia sort of scrolling um, stories with archival material, video, et cetera. Um, yeah, I think that just by way of a little bit of background, this was a story very close to our hearts as the children of immigrants. We were always interested in exploring the immigration experience and um, just sort of uh, had this kind of revelatory moment when early on uh, as an uh, impetus for the project where we started meeting some of the business owners in our own neighborhood and just finding some incredible stories and figured, you know, at the time I was working in projects in Central America, et cetera, and this was, we had such richness um, sort of right uh, in front of us. And so I think motives um, are multiple, but one is uh, sort of uh, to kind of encourage people to interact. Like if we feel if we want to uh, preserve, and a lot of these types of businesses as these neighborhoods are gentrifying or very much under threat. We don't have any commercial uh, rent protection in Toronto. Um, so part of our motive was to, uh, to celebrate these, um, these institutions and these types of stories as a way maybe to generate some appreciation of them um, from society uh, writ large. Um, but then also I think in Toronto and in Canada, I mean, while not perfect, I think the uh, way we all get along and the degree of inclusivity is actually maybe one of our strong points. So that was definitely something we wanted to share more broadly. And we were very pleased actually to launch this project. If you don't make it here, you can see it online. Um, we launched it in the fall. We did it episodically. So it's 10 businesses. We chopped it up into four parts, launched them in weekly installments uh, through the Globe and Mail, which is Canada's major, or with the Globe and Mail, Canada's major national newspaper. I might have five minutes. You have like 10 seconds. That was really perfect. Thank you. <laughs> you have a good instinct for five minutes. Thank you, Mark. Um, so finally joining us on the panel is Alex Pearson, who is the founder of Red Thread Media uh, and also the creator of Future Aleppo that some of you may have seen um, within, the, within the expo. So um, Future Aleppo was awarded this year's Alternate Realities Commission um, here at DocFest in association with FACT and with Arts Council England. Um, and I'm not going to even attempt to... to to best explain it, because I think it's, it's better to hear directly from you, Alex, what, the, uh, what it is to you and, and what the story is. I was hoping you would explain I could, it. I could attempt I it, but I feel, like, <laughs> I feel like I would do a terrible disservice to the work. So I, I, should, I should put credit where it's due. Um, I mean, the real creator is, is a boy called Mohammed Katesh, um, and he is a boy from the city of Aleppo in Syria. And uh, I came across him back in 2015, uh, from a film shot from a fantastic citizen journalist called Wad al uh in a short uh, piece for Channel 4, um, produced by Zara, who's up there. Um, and she wrote, she makes these beautiful pieces which really sort of restore your hope in humanity in the worst possible places. So she produced another film that was based around a bomb crater uh, from the shelling in uh, Aleppo, and kids had filled it with water and turned it into a swimming pool. And another one, there was a burnt out, bombed out bus, and people came along and painted it and turned it into a climbing frame. Uh, but the story with, uh, with Mohammed really resonated. He was, um, at the time, he was about 11 years old, and he started, uh, he, he, he could see the destruction around him, and his dream was to restore it, uh, the city that he loved so much. So he, um, he climbed onto the roof of his apartment building, and as he observed the buildings collapsing and the destruction around him, he would uh, scavenge and find materials around him to actually restore and build them. And if, if you go to the Millennium Gallery, you'll see an example of his work. 
Uh, before long, it was a bit unsafe for him to stay on the roof. There were snipers nearby, and obviously there's bombing and shelling. So his father gave him a garage, and within a very short space of time, he had taken over the entire garage. Uh, and again, on the website, there's a video, as so you can see just how scaled that model was. Um, unfortunately, the situation in Aleppo became increasingly bad, and um, we, we got him over to Turkey, uh, but he had, to he had to leave the model behind. Um, so when we met in Turkey, we sort of started rebuilding again, and we looked at different ways that we could use his work as a... Uh, I mean, he, he was very much into this idea of preserving the city, but we, we, we sort of talked about how the city was a, was a source of polyphony and many voices that were kind of lost in the, in the destruction. So I, we went out there and I took a suitcase full of uh, like very accessible tech and um, we played with uh, uh, this conductive ink called Bear Conductive. So we started painting his models and we started programming little voices in them. And it was the first opportunity for him to see how you know, his model could come to life. Um, and we played around with other things, augmented reality. Um, but one thing that really kind of affected me there is that he has a sister called Limar, and um, she'd, she's four years old, and um, she'd, she'd only ever seen the conflict. So we put a, she, she had a Google Cardboard, and it was a cartoon, um, VR, and, and it just, you could see her body lift. And it sort of dawned on me that you know, this, you know, we could you take this, these two things and combine them so the kids would have a sense of agency. They could build, and then we could use the VR component, uh, which you can kind of see a prototype of over in, uh, in the Millennium Gallery, and actually allow children to create their world and visit it digitally so that they never have to, like Mohammed, lose the model again. So we can use a simple process called photogrammetry, which is where you just take lots of, lots of pictures and you stitch them together and then place it within a virtual world. And, uh, and yeah, it, 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 it exists. People can go visit it. They can, you know, re, uh, re, regather in this virtual space. And um, that's where we're going to. Uh, I should say that whenever there isn't that. But the idea is, yeah, to, to create a, a world for people, a safe space which is created by them, for them. Um, but uh, do I have 30 seconds left? Okay, so um, I, that's essentially the, the project in a nutshell, but I, I'd like to introduce you uh, to Mohammed in a little video he made uh, for us. I, sh I should add that we, we've only been learning English for three months, um, and architect is a hard word, yeah. <laughs> To that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you all so much. Um, so I think there are roaming mics, and we will we will be coming to you shortly. As I say, I think often the, the best discussions are, are those with the wisdom in the room. So do think about what you'd like to say. Um, I, as chair's prerogative, would like to to ask at least a question or two, if I may. Um, to, as a, a reminder, because I know I always forget names in panels, we have Henaro, we have Mark, and we have Alex. You're welcome to ask all or either. Um, for me, so, so many questions, but I think I'd like to start with um, the, the work that all three of you make comes from very, uh, very kind of potent situations and are born of very strong relationships that you have with the, with the context. I'm wondering if when you look more broadly and you think about how people are starting to encounter your work, particularly starting to show it at places like Sheffield, do you have hopes or ambitions for what um, audiences or participants or users or players or whatever the word is that we don't really know yet, um, how you wish them to receive the work or what you want them to do now? Um, well, um, in my case, I think um, maybe to show um, the potential of other, other people like um, ideas for games, because, for example, myself, Gonzalo, jo Jonathan, um, uh, we just uh, starting out as, uh, as uh, working in game development. Uh, we, 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 uh, for me personally, something that I really love, I'm, it's kind of my purpose now, so um, I, I would love to like, keep developing, develop um, my, my potential mm -hmm. as a game designer, and hopefully um, these game borders uh, can show everyone like, the experience of other people and also help, me, help um, to show the, the powers of, of, of Mexican game development mm -hmm. that we have the potential to do something great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I could push you a little bit on the, um, the mechanic that you mentioned earlier. For, mm -hmm. for those of you um, familiar with 
a number of games, often when you die in a game, you respawn or you go back to a save point or you, you sort of magically just stand up again and there we are. Um, you've chosen not to do that here. Could you explain to us what happens instead and what that creates? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's kind of also um, reference the hard, the hard journey that actually um, uh, people do in order to cross the border. So it's not like you have a second chance to continue a checkpoint like in, in video games. It's, it's kind of a life sac sacrifice that you have to make as a game designer, but the thing is you have to also have a point. Because um, no matter where you die, you will start all over the beginning. So it's, it's something like also to relate how difficult is the journey to cross the border. Yeah. Thank you. Well, could you tell us a little bit about, about the way that, um, that the work's being received and what, how that's kind of giving a window into a different narrative? Um, yeah, I think that um, for us the emphasis, again, was really on accessibility, but also in terms of design, our catchphrase is that we like to design for different levels of engagement. So what that means in this project, which in its, if you were to do everything, there's something like 75 minutes of content, so we call it a feature length interactive experience. Mm -hmm. um, but also um, the intention was very much that in like a minute or two you can get it and get something out of it. and. Uh, or you can spend that time, you know, I ran into a, in the gallery yesterday, a young lady who had spent something like 50 minutes, which I thought was just incredible, considering all the other amazing yeah. options. Um, so I think for us, it's been really gratifying to take that from a conceptual level, especially there's a, we encountered a lot of um, skepticism about uh, people's attention span in this sort of online doc sphere. So to sort of see that play out and see uh, and confirm that people are getting meaningful experiences from very short engagements, but then some people just running wild with it, um, that's been really gratifying. Mm -hmm. um, also for us, a big focus has been on the educational side is making our goal is to have this be used widely in Canadian classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, and we've started to do a little bit of that kind of outreach. Um, and that's been, we were in a classroom uh, the other week, a grade four or five, so like nine and 10 year olds. and. Um, just to watch them getting into it uh, was really gratifying. So I feel like um, that's a lot of positive reinforcement. I feel like we're going in the right direction. You mentioned you had like, almost traditional media partners in, in the globe, was it? And, uh, yeah. Is that we, a way to try and kind of reach that more mainstream? Big time. Yeah, I think going back to the earliest conceptions, uh, we definitely wanted a major media partner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're maybe, a, you know, the National Film Board in Canada, which does wonderful work and has basically its own sort of distribution realm is one thing. But for us, we're very cognizant that, um, I mean, while, whilst someone can put, anyone can put anything online to actually get eyeballs is a whole different story. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that was very much a strategy to use an organization with an existing um, infrastructure. And um, it worked out, uh, I think, for us. They didn't fund the project, um, which some people are surprised by. but. Uh, it's definitely on a scale that's maybe a little bit beyond what their kind of budget, um, you know, would be. It's very diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's for, for future Aleppo, I mean, Mohammed particularly has a really specific aim for where this goes next. Could you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, so the, the hope um, is that we will expand into a sort of outreach campaign and, and, and take it around to camps and... and uh, encourage children to emulate him and to, to sort of establish that agency that he gets from making models and imbuing them with their own stories. Like he was, there's this big fancy word for psychogeography that, that buildings inhabit spirits and, and, and this is really kind of what we're trying to sort of illustrate that all of these buildings that you see on this grid were homes and they, they people live within them and it's the, the model itself becomes a vessel for all of this sort of polyphonic stories. Um, so, you know, he's He's very aware that he, you know, he's, he's, I'm putting him up there, but he wants it to be a very, you know, contributory thing. Like every kid can, and that's the beauty of it, like in terms of agency, you just need paper, glue, and paint, and you can just structure something, and you can, you know, if, if you've got the imagination for it, you can just say, look, this was my home, and this is how I wish it was still, and this is where I want to go back to. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's what he wants to sort of encourage people, because it keeps him going. And I think, it, you know, when you meet other children, you can kind of see that they have to find something for themselves. And, and, and this is a really nice sort of way of doing it. We, 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 I tried it last year as well, and it's, you know, in terms of that being one audience, like in terms of the sort of uh, audience outside of the camps, it's, 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 it's,
Absolutely, sorry. Um, yeah, no, we tried it with a, a UK audience as well, and it's, it's again, it's, it's a very communal thing when you, you know, because it's a building exercise, you know, you're, you're, you can be sharing stories at the same time as handing people scissors and things like that, um, and it's, it's, you know, there's no barriers to it, which I think is, is a nice way, and it restores the agency, because for me, you know, Syria became a very much a big picture thing for a long time. Um, you know, you hear about the, the big players, but the truth is there are, there are really a lot of people very badly affected, and they're, you know, they're still full of hope. Um, and this is, you know, this is just one mechanism to sort of restore that. Thank you. I think that's, that's a, a perfect way to, um, to be able to open out to the audience, actually. I think there are some roaming mics around, so if you have a question, if you pop your hand in the air, then we'll, we'll bring you a microphone. Uh, first one over here. If you can hold on for the microphone, that would be great. Thank you. That way we can all hear you. Hello, I have a question for Alex. Can you share with me um, how long it takes you to, to say, film and edit the piece for, the, uh, for, for that piece, the production timeline? Uh -huh. And uh, what are the biggest challenges if the same story is to be done for traditional TV versus such a VR clip? So, um, yeah, uh, I should point out we're, we're just at the beginning. Um, Sheffield were very generous and, and it's allowed us to work with a fantastic production studio called Marshmallow Laser Feast. And so in terms of the timeline, we, we, we pulled together the VR in a very short amount of time. Um, and I, I don't see it going to conventional media. Like the, the, the hope is that it will exist on web VR so that at any given time, um, once we've taken these models, it would be really nice if we could, uh, we will capture them in the camps and we will post them in a web VR portal. And then we will just send the URLs back to the camp so that the children can revisit them themselves. Um, I, I, in terms of wide distribution, I, I, I haven't really strategized that. I'm kind of just really thinking about the people who, who need this. Um, so uh, that's where I'd like to go with it, web VR. And at the moment, like, it's finding programmers who can work in A-frame and everything like that. But um, that's kind of the, and the timeline will be long. I mean, it's a case of going, collecting assets, um, and then, you know, using programmers to actually build these web VR portals and then making them available on mobile uh, phones and tablets and things so that they can actually put them in a Google uh, Cardboard and actually revisit them themselves. So, in terms of conventional TV, um, yeah, to 20th century, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I realize if you're in my peripheral vision, you may have to wave really frantically, but I will try and catch you. Um, in fact, there's one just behind. Thank you. Hi, I have a similar question for um, Mark. Uh, what's the production timeline? Because you said around two years, and I was wondering what the process was like um, from the beginning to the product that you have now. Um, it's actually over five years that we've been working on the project. Um, our ethos was to start with the skills that we had, which was very much video production. Um, so the, a lot of the video was early on, and then we continued with gathering sort of personal archive, which figures quite strongly, and then eventually more general. There's a lot of sort of uh, community history as well that came later. But um, I mean, it was, uh, it was a little bit belabored, I think, because as I mentioned, uh, Rabinder, who I work with, actually uh, learned to code sort of over the last three years, three and a half years while we were doing this. So that became his focus and I kind of took care of the rest and uh, yeah, it's a lot of, uh, it's, it's thousands and thousands of hours actually in this project. Can I extend that um, production pipeline question a little bit to Hinar? So seven years, seven months, um, seven days was it? Yes, one week. Incredible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was uh, why why sort of why was it such an intense period? What was that? Yeah, because um, we want to like um, have a game. We want to make sure that because there is a, a problem in game development that sometimes um, they take way longer because sometimes either the 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 artist, the the programmer, the game designer get too ambitious and they <laughs> like want to add eventually more stuff. And eventually, the game never gets released. <laughs> so in that case, we have to stick to a timeline, to goals, to make sure the game to get in the deadline. I read that you applied a kind of um, a, a term that's used in the games industry as a games jam mentality, which is yes. often where a number of people from different games design backgrounds will spend an intense like two days or something together. Mm -hmm. And you sort of forced yourselves into a games jam for seven days. Yes. Yeah. 
pizza and beer. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> That's intense. Lovely. Thank you. Who else has questions in our audience? So there's a lovely cluster like emerging here. These are, the, these are our questioners. Yeah, yes. <coughs> Hi. Um, Hinaro and Alex, we're here talking about um, alternate realities. And indeed, you've both taken on things that are very real and serious and are happening now. Mm -hmm. But um, it's interesting that you've both done it through a very a playful lens, an imaginative lens. You're, you're working in pixels. You're working in paper and color and models. Do you think that do you think that a kind of distancing lens is helpful for when getting people to encounter these kinds of issues? Well, the decision um, that we took to make the pixel art because um, it's because um, uh, it was it's a really versatile and uh, uh, efficient way to do um, to do the the overall um, artwork for for a game because. Uh, we only have one week and making like models, um, 3D models is going to take way more uh, more time. So we were discussing uh, and we took the, the pixel art approach because uh, not only gives the game also uniqueness and also I, I think the game also gives, um, gives us more room, more time to develop other things like the coding, the game design, the, um, the debugging and the overall process that takes us to make the game. And also Gonzalo is a really um, amazing um, art, and he picked up, he was, also it was his first time like doing pixel art, and he did an amazing job and at it. So um, it was quicker for him to do our assets to complete the game. I love the fact that it's almost by virtue of, of necessity, but I think as someone who perhaps grew up with like 8-bit pixel yeah. games, there's a certain familiarity yeah. of the form that really yeah, resonated with me. That yes, exactly. It's strange to see a kind of yeah. a really pertinent contemporary circumstance in a kind of a paperboy environment. Yeah, we will grow up with like playing Super Mario and NES games, and we like also got central influence. And so, for example, Paper Please, that um, it was mentioned in the previous talk, mm. it, we took a lot of influence for, for it too. Thank you. Yeah, so, so in terms of, of the issue um, uh, and through the, the paper craft aesthetic, um, I think, I mean, the first time we sort of went out there, I, I tried to pretend to be a journalist and <laughs> um, I interviewed the family and, uh, you know, it, it, it took on a different guise. Like, it, you know, all of a sudden you had a, you know, a camera and you were kind of filming and they were, you know, recounting their stories. And I, I, I was very aware that, you know, I, I people have their stories told by other people, and I, and I felt like this wasn't the way to do that. I'm not a journalist, so I wouldn't really be able to do it justice. So um, in terms of, of how we, we wanted to sort of approach it was, was to sort of create this platform that was very, that wasn't heavy, that was, you know, because the stories are horrific, you know, and, I, and a lot of them we've edited out. Um, but it's quite affecting when you see the, the contrast between the, his vision and this, this very accessible, I think it's beautiful to watch the paper. It's just, you see the, the creases and everything like that. And then you hear the sort of, and, it, and he doesn't do it in a kind of overly emotive way. Like he's quite matter of fact about it. And he's, you know, when he, when he tells you the stories, it's, it's, it just, you know, that was regime and there were snipers. And, um, and, and then, uh, but then you also sort of hear the response to that as well, like, you know, this was a train station and, you know, what I really want to do with a train station is to widen the track so we can high speed rail. Um, so he's quite pragmatic as well. And I, I think that was, that was more, so it's, it's looking ahead and I, I think that there's certainly a lot of coverage of, of just how atrocious um, the situation in Aleppo and the whole of Syria is and I think through through his eyes, it's it's more forward-looking. I mean, it, it's it's still very much a testament to the past and what what's happened. And I, I was aware that I was kind of omitting it a little bit. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, it w it would be hard to combine the two. Like we thought, you know, maybe we could put pictures up of the the the, the, the destruction, and, and certainly I have done that. But it's especially if you put it towards children, you almost you almost don't want to show them that. You want to give them an in, and the in is. Isn't this kid? You know, you know, this, he's being creative. You know, he's, and he he has a you know he he's doing something, and you can do something too. Um, so so you, you're not just bombarding them with with really heavy images all the time. Thank you. On the on the questions of sort of the materials and the tools that we choose, 
Mark, you've taken the, the uh, unique, well, not unique at all, actually, but the, the decision to, to do not just an interactive documentary, but also a more traditional film format. Do, could you talk us through kind of why and also what each of them brings? Different audience? Or? Sure. Um, the linear film, which is a 35-minute film, is very much focused on the um, creating a conversation between the participants and very much tracing um, the immigration experience. It's like a, we call it a film in seven chapters, so it does have this kind of, you know, different approximate stages. Um, whereas with the interactive, I mean, we were very cognizant uh, or the motives early on was um, how, to, how to share the geography um, and that's part of it, but then also like, we, you know, in that context, like each person's story is very much ensconced in their own little world, which was also part of why we went with uh, entrepreneurs, like small business owners, as opposed to just um, people, you know, like this notion of, of like the importance of the setting and the place. And that was really something that we felt we could get into with the interactive in a way that we couldn't um, with Does the linear film. Does it take you closer? Does it take you closer? Yeah. To, to their the stories? To the subjects, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a different type of experience, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I think that what the sort of conversational level in the linear film is, is special, but I think that there's also um, a value in, um, in allowing the, the user, the interactant, um, to, to, um, to sort of be able to control things and also to be able sort of to choose who they're most interested in. You know, if you're only going to spend a couple minutes and your family, say, is from Jamaica, you know, perhaps, or your background, you know, that it might be, you know, you go straight to there, or you, mm -hmm. so I think there's some value on that side, too. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Any more from the floor? I'm just, I'm just going to do the full panorama of my view, just in case I'm only looking forward, but I think we're okay. Yes, please, thank you. Hi, um, thanks everyone for your work. And um, I'm wondering, it related directly to the, to the title of the session, Small Stories, Sort of Big World, how do any of you look at this idea of the, the entire story ecosystem of your subject and the way that you're giving us this really nice one way in, like this boy in this place in Aleppo, but then maybe I go home and I read the New York Times article differently <laughs> or I go look at all the other projects. Project Syria I see differently. That we're all, instead of maybe the auteur, like my piece, that you're, are you consciously considering all the other work that's been done and being done relative to your subject and you're, you're giving us this one portal in. Are you working into the big ecosystem and, and kind of wanting to seed it? I'm just curious about that. You know, do you want to... Oh man, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, good, yeah. a it's little a difficult question, but um, well, I think uh, right now the, um, the, uh, the game that we made is by some um, Gonzalo of parents' experience of crossing the border, and um, I think that um, it's something like give or or, or or solve this project like a or or how do you say it or like a small. Um, a small piece of, of something to share to the world, to see like, um, to see the experience of, of um, immigration um, through, uh, through, the, through a game media, I think. Um, I think it's something like, um, it's not very common, uh, and, and we try our best to like replicate that in, in, in a video game format, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to reflect on that? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of joining the conversation, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, on one hand, yeah, it's, it's a vessel, it's a, it's a way of disseminating information, stories, and things like that, but I'm going to sound really callous, but my, my concern is Mohammed, um, and in terms of the audience, like, I want, it, I want it to be a tool more than an than a, than a, than a exhibit. Um, and, and I want it to function as a, as a you know, ongoing thing. So it's, it, it, it really is that kind of essence of transmedia and, and it belongs to the audience so that they can return to it. Um, you know, I, I'm not trying to be very dismissive of people, but I, I think it's, you know, for me, like that was the, the crux of it. Like I, I felt like, you know, stories were being told and they're being told to people, but sometimes there's 
the actual subjects get lost in it. And I, and I see it with them, like, you know, that they're very aware that, you know, people are get, getting scared of, um, of journalists a little bit. There was a story of, uh, was it Oman, uh, Omar, the boy who had the very famous picture taken oh, of him, yeah. and, and, you know, his family are now saying it was taken entirely out of context. Um, and, and I think, you know, you have to be kind of aware of who you're telling stories to and how you're using your subject. Um, and and in, at least what I'm trying to do or what Mohammed is trying to do is, is to make sure the subject is the audience. So they're creating it for themselves. It, it's a tool. It's a, it, the purpose remains within their ecosystem, their ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, we certainly see this work as, as part of a very small contribution to a much larger and expansive and ongoing discourse and discussion around immigration. I think that, um, you know, early on when we were talking about what we were thinking about doing, several people, you know, oh, well, immigration hasn't that been done, um, which we always found to be a bit strange. And I think that, um, at least in the Canadian context, I don't know about here, but I think that uh, exploring immigration stories, actually considering how, like, how, how fundamental it is to the society, is actually not something that is at all um, over-explored. Um, so, and I think too that with issues like this, that, you know, not even forget about every generation, but we are, you know, next year I hope that there is something else that in a major way is sort of addressing these, um, trying to get at, you know, these issues of diversity and integration and such, so, yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for your questions. It's been, it's been lovely to explore some of these ideas more fully with you. Um, as, as we mentioned, all of the work that has been discussed today can be found in the Millennium Gallery within the Interactive Expo. So I would urge you, if you haven't already, to spend some time with the work. And uh, I'd just like to say thank you so much to Genaro, to Mark, and to Alex for sharing with us. Thank you. <laughs>